Bonjour du mondo, and welcome back to 15 with Fosco, the podcast, and to part two of my conversation with global historian Ali Kara Mustafa. Last week, we traced Ali's personal and professional path from St. Louis, Missouri to Bologna, Italy, and were treated to a truly illuminating narrative about Italy's relationship to its Mediterranean neighbors and to the Islamic world through the ages. This week, Ali and I continue to tackle those questions and also take a deeper dive into an array of topics like Italy's colonial past, post-war history, contemporary politics, and immigration today. Grazie mille. E buon ascolto. But, um, but right after sort of the decolonization of Libya, Italy established its sort of um, special relationship with Libya, which persisted over the years despite ups and downs. Uh, Gaddafi and uh, Berlusconi, oh, sure. the Italian prime minister in the 90s and 2000s, um, had a close relationship. Um, Italy had privileged access to Libyan oil. So, um, but what I want to say is I'm um, going off on tangents. It's what fine. I what I, I wanted it. to say is that um, the imperial ambitions obviously completely shifted after World War II. So what you had was obviously a collapse of that Italian empire which was very overstretched and fragile in any case. And Italy becomes part of the western bloc and is really under American domination and influence. And in a way, we're still in that world today, funny as it sounds. I mean, a lot of changes have happened um, with um, sort of what we could call in the 80s and 90s, well, the rise of neoliberalism and uh, finance and the global economy kind mm-hmm. of shifting away, you know, America you, losing some of its economic advantages, um, obviously the end of the Cold War. Um, but we're still in a situation today where Italy squarely sees itself as a part of an America, a U.S.-oriented alliance, right? Yeah. That's NATO. Um, NATO and NATO-adjacent, a whole range of NATO-adjacent um, entities, including the European Union, which I think is part of the reason why Italians have this strong European identity today. Since the 1950s, that's something that has been consciously cultivated um, in Europe. It was supposed to be a, um, you know, a mechanism to ensure that war would never break out again, especially mm. between France and Germany. Right. Um, but it was also part of this American plan of creating a bulwark against Soviet power. Yeah. And, you know, and, and then eventually communism everywhere, you know, so. I'm sorry, I'm just, you know, I'm thinking about the world right yeah. now. And here we are sitting in this little studio, you know, yeah. <laughs> and recording our little podcast. And just my mind is going in so many directions about sort of just where we are. You know, you've traced this recent history, mm-hmm. right? And... I just saw the pictures yesterday on, you know, on uh, pretty much in every international newspaper of Joe, Joe Biden, our, our president, with Georgia Maloney, mm-hmm. um, really speaking about this, exactly what you're saying, right? So they were, you know, the sort of this united front for Ukraine. And, you know, obviously they spoke about what's going on in Gaza, et cetera. But sort of Joe, Uncle Joe, you know, putting his arm around Georgia. yeah. Did you see the images? I Have you looked? I think I saw it skimming the, the headlines. But yeah, and sort of just this closer. this very um, very sim- very warm and intimate sort of you know posturing mm-hmm. on both of their parts that really reinforces exactly what you just said about sort of Italy's political history, like where we are right now. Right, right, it's right. It's fascinating to me. Well, and one of the things, so what happens is in the second half of the 20th century is you get that shift away. There's no longer, Italy no longer has these sort of illusions about building its own empire. But it does occupy this um, ambiguous position. It's still on the frontier um, with, first of all, with um, sort of the Soviet bloc. I mean, right across the Adriatic, you have Yugoslavia, which is, you know, uh, part, you know, it's it's an ambiguous part of the Soviet bloc, but then um, Italy is so sort of close to, closer to you know, the Eastern bloc. At the same time, Italy has the largest communist party of all the Western countries. Um, it's uh, an interesting communist party. 
Yes. It is. And <laughs> it's an have, Italian Communist Party. It is, but they had very direct connections to Moscow. Absolutely. Togliatti, Palmiro Togliatti, exactly. the head of it would go, you know, back and forth. Absolutely. So, um, and so obviously the U.S. saw this as a big threat. So this is, Italy's on the so, kind of Soviet frontier, but also with the Islamic world, it's on the frontier. And in, in the Arab countries, you have the rise of um, Arab socialism and Nasser, the president of Egypt, and it's this sort of pan-Arab um, sentiment that is socialism adjacent yeah. in a sort of um, in a sort of ambiguous way, but certainly cultivating close ties with the Soviet Union. So Italy's in the middle of all that, trying to maintain good relationships with everyone, mainly for its own economic benefit. Obviously, um, and so that's a situation that basically I think with its ups and downs, you know, has, has persisted. Um, and Italy has tried to maintain its close ties with North African countries for energy purposes, mm -hmm. you know, Libya, Algeria, um, and tried to maintain a sort of ambiguous middle ground about Israel-Palestine, mm -hmm. um, you know, and done that in very interesting ways, by the way. Um, and so I think, you know... I don't know if we're, a new era would will start soon or not. I don't see the sort of those sort of alliances weakening, as you say, with you know, because Italy still sees itself, and even even with Maloney, you know, it's interesting. I'm sure your listeners will know that with the rise of the right wing in Italy in the last few years, there was this um, uh, part of the kind of right wing political discourse in Italy and in countries like Italy, but. Um, I'd say certainly if you look at things that Meloni has said or Matteo Salvini, um, who's the uh, leader of the, of the Nor Lega Party, um, so one of, the, one of the current coalitions in the current Italian government, um, they criticized Europe a lot, right? So they criticized especially the disproportionate role played by France and Germany, Germany because yeah. the EU is great, it's democratic, we're all friends. At the end of the day, France and Germany typically decide, sometimes in a you know sort of closed behind closed doors, mm -hmm. what's going to happen. Right. Because that's where the administrative and economic power, power of is, Europe yeah. lies. But when once Maloney got into office, we haven't seen a big change. There, she's not anti-Europe. Uh, she's not shifting away, um, or if she's if she is, she's trying to do it very very <laughs> subtly and gradually. So I don't see that Italy is currently sort of politically shifting more towards, um, let's say, Islamic countries or, no, or I don't see you know, that. because she did use, Meloni did use sort of anti-colonial. It's very interesting. She tried, she talked about France's colonial legacy in Africa mm -hmm. and she, as if she was a champion of these countries, but she's not actually proposing, you know, new trade policies mm -hmm. or new relations with those countries, as, you know, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm not like an expert on politics today. So that's sort of the political picture, right. I feel, and we can get into more of that too. But uh, I think the last part of your question was also kind of just Italian society today. So one thing I wanted to touch on there is, I mean, the fact that we talked about how Italian society is not a monolith, and, and neither is the Islamic world, of course. And so the kind of, there are a lot of Muslims in Italy today. Absolutely. <laughs> But a lot of it's a complicated immigration because it is not necessarily um, the profile of um, immigrants to Italy uh, does not closely match Italy's colonial history. It's, it's not exactly similar to, say, France. France or even the UK. Or even the UK, right. Because we do have a lot of South Asian uh, Muslims in Italy, a lot of, uh, a lot of people from Bangladesh and Pakistan, um, excuse me, and uh, there is, uh, there are some, there are important North African communities, yeah. but, you know, certainly not a, certainly not a, a particularly large number of Libyans, for example, mm -hmm. I mean, just because it is a country with a much smaller population. So I think we have to be, I think it's a bit of, it's more of a rupture. I think the arrival of the new immigrants starting in the 80s and 90s I think especially starting after the 90s, um, uh, there's been this, you know, increase in immigration, which has been kind of corresponding to, I think, 
this sort of neoliberal shift in, in you know globalizing trade and the World Trade Organization Absolutely. opening of uh, you know sort of opening up of a lot of these economies in other parts of the world, right. which has immiserated a lot of people who then you know come to Europe and seek uh, seek some kind of better life. A better life, yeah. Um, and so it is analogous, I think, to what we see in in a lot of European countries. Um, and Italy's dealing with it in a different way than the U.S. because it's a, I mean, the U.S. is its own case, obviously, but it's a more recent immigration here. Yeah. It's um, mainly still first generation. Um, the economic and the class profile of immigrants is also very um, different, you yeah. know, um, because uh, you have your, you know, I'd say if we're going to really simplify things, <clears throat> different groups that um, have come here under different economic conditions. Mm -hmm. So you have you have a lot of Chinese immigration. They come in with a lot of money. They invest. They buy stores. Mm -hmm. um, they come in with capital. And they um, really are um, sort of more, they're quite isolated communities. And in, in Florence, there's a very big one nearby. Huge in community in Prato. Probably, yeah, yeah, you probably know more about them, more about that than I do. because Very maybe, present in the textile industry. Okay, yeah. um, and a, a huge sort of a, a superpower um, mm -hmm. in that industry. Very complicated. Yeah. Um, yes, but, so I'm not going to talk yeah, about that. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but it is a, it is a, it's a complicated question. But I think the immigration question in Italy today is so complicated. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to interrupt you, but I do, I do no, want to no, ask no. you a question because mm -hmm. it is important. Mm -hmm. um, because Italy has such a recent history of immigration. It's something that sort of is, is um, you know, Italy and, and the society sort of are coming to terms with it on a daily basis. Um, what do you think about the fact that, for example, Germany recently, very recently, just sort of um, kind of freed up the way to um, giving immigrants an easier time um, because in, in recognition of the fact that, you know, there's an aging population. Germany is is nowhere, I don't think, numbers-wise, um, as dire as this situation is here in Italy in terms of, you know, zero birth rate. And, you know, we all yeah. know the, the aging population. We all know the numbers. So what Germany had do, has done quite intelligently is said, you know what? let's 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 free up access let's let's help people let's expedite the process um in italy that hasn't happened yet and i don't know if it will happen um but i am curious um just i didn't want to interrupt but no, will okay. Italy? i mean what is it going to take for italy to to get to that point sort of is part of my question and then another part of my question which i really um am curious to hear and then i want to sort of move into a uh, closing um, the conversation, talking a little more about you and your your projects. But what what do you think it it would take for Italy to embrace this um, the sort of the richness of the immigrant population? Mm -hmm. Because I I think that it's one of the few things that's going to save the country. Mm -hmm. um, Italy is incredibly um, dynamic. Uh, resilient country. Uh, there's a lot of creativity, a lot of talent, a lot of money, mm -hmm. a lot of industry. There's there's a lot of Italy that people out there don't know. I mean, in addition to these things like all the connections you've been talking about, which have been so illuminating, mm -hmm. but a lot of people don't know sort of you know, the structure, you know, of this country and the fact that there is a real need um, for for workers, for, for, for children, for, you know, all of these things. So I'm just curious is how you see Italy coming to terms with this. I mean, do you see... Yeah, I... Um, no, I'm glad you interrupted and redirected because I was going off on a <laughs> tangent about something that I'm not even very knowledgeable about. So um, I'm pretty pessimistic. I mean, for a, a few reasons. I think the current economic model and political model is pretty dysfunctional. I don't, I'm, um, I think that, um, so to expand on that, I mean, I, I have my doubts about um, the fact that bringing in a lot of, um, you know, immigrants um, because they have more children and they're, you know, that that will somehow regenerate the country as sort of a, on a sort of demographic argument. Mm -hmm. I just think there's a lot of young, I'm not an economist, I have to put that disclaimer, 
There's a lot of young unemployed Italians. Absolutely. So the jobs aren't there um, because I think. Yes and no. I'm not saying well. Okay, yeah, and I because like to yeah. because there's a like there's a big crisis in the hospitality industry. Mm-hmm. It's impossible to hire people right now. Nobody is applying for these jobs. Okay, so the good jobs aren't there then, or they're not paying them enough. Right. Okay, so why? There you go. They're not paying them enough, so okay. I don't think let's bring in people who will accept. No, lower. no, no. I I don't, oh, I'm not saying, saying that at all. I'm not. I know that's not what you're saying, but some people. That's oh, sort definitely. Of an argument that, that a lot of people, you know, that well, immigrants come here and they'll work. They'll work cheaper jobs um, under sometimes very bad conditions. Absolutely, un- um, terribly. So I think yeah. So if people aren't taking the jobs because they're not paying enough, then. I don't know. We have to Everything needs to change. I mean, that's that's definitely, I mean, I pointed out this particular industry because it's one that I'm familiar with because yeah. my partner's a chef, but also it's um, it's sort of like on the news every day almost because, you know, in a country like Italy, right. if the hospitality industry can no longer host mm-hmm. because there aren't enough people, there needs to be a radical change. There's, I mean, it's happening in the U.S. It's happening all over the world. Um, rightfully so. Um, you know, there has to be a major shift in, you know, in the economy, in, in the job market, what have you. But um, there also has to be a change sort of in the attitude that that we have here or that Italians have in terms of sort of like, and this is, I mean, this is a conversation for a, a really like yeah, yeah, yeah. three more podcasts, but also sort of like, how we need to, how Italy as a country needs to respond to a changing labor market, a different generation. The fact that people are no longer willing, whether they're Italians or recent immigrants or, you know, whatever, are no longer willing to accept certain conditions. So if the country, what I was trying to say and what I think Germany has done with the little knowledge, I know nothing about Germany. I mean, let's be honest. I know very little, but the, the article that I read Um, intrigued me when the news came out because I thought, well, could this be a solution? Mm -hmm. Could this be a model? In other words, we simplify the path to citizenship or Mm -hmm. to legal um, residency, which then, in other words, step by step, then maybe we can really, you know, start to make that machine move um, whereby we're providing, you know, really solid, good job opportunities that give people the possibility of having a really decent life. And here I'm talking about Italians, immigrants alike. It's a problem for, for, yeah. for in this country to, to make ends meet. The salaries are really low. They are, they are. No, I mean, this is, yeah, I would love, this is something I'm trying to wrap my mind around. I won't talk about it at length because I'm, as I said, I don't know that much about it. But, um, I mean, yeah, I think... Um, Making it easier for people to become citizens or work here—that's one approach. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't. I think that you know, you're. Uh, if you're not doing a more kind of radical program of I don't know, shifting sort of of job creation or yeah. of changing the conditions people work in, then you're just introducing you know more people competing for the same jobs. Exactly. Um, which could have benefits and drawbacks as far as the sort of whole economy goes. Um, also, shifting Italy's trade policies. Um, it, this was something where someone like a Maloney who likes to use those nationalist and anti-colonial colonial, um, sort of tone, those that kind of way of speaking sometimes. But Italy also, for example, just to give a tiny example, um, it's the tomato industry here, oh, yeah. where there's a lot of African immigrants who come, African migrants who come and work for um, basically in sort of quite hazy condition, like Absolutely, um, yeah. that they're not quite legal, they make very little money, and then um, that allows them to sell tomatoes cheap here and export the surplus back to um, African countries. I'm thinking of the example of Ghana for, for tomatoes specifically, where then their economy is flooded with cheap extra tomatoes, they have a tomato-based economy, and then when that collapses, more of their migrants come here looking for work. So it's a vicious cycle yeah. that um, someone that, that isn't being talked about in European politics broadly mm-hmm. or in Italy, and that could, you know, uh, that could be something that would be rethought in a way that could benefit both Italians and people who want to come here to work. Mm-hmm. I'm not against, like, I'm not for, like, closed borders or anything like that. I do think this sort of globalized, like, you know, oh, let's open everything up vision can be, which is not, I'm not suggesting that's what you're saying, 
um, can sometimes be risk um, not changing anything, but just you know sort of thinking like yeah, thinking of it in in terms of let's be more open minded. Right. Um, but I don't see any of those shifts coming right now. Mm -hmm. I I hope you know fingers crossed that some changes will be coming. Yeah, and I think that it's sort of I it's inevitable, right? I yeah. mean, just the way if we just look at any sort of any part of the world right now, I think it's just inevitable. People have always moved. People are still moving and people will always move. Um, Italy is a country that has a very complicated job market. Um, yeah. the workers are really protected. Yeah. Um, the laws are extremely favorable, mm -hmm. um, for the employee mm -hmm. and that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, um, but there, I think there does need to be a sort of a, a very sort of a 360 degree systemic sort of social, you name it, shift, um, whereby um, people, people once again, no problem, people once again have, um, have agency, have pride, have, um, feel like they have the ability to make, um, to have a, a, a good life. I mean, I'm, we're talking about very basic stuff here, but um, it's a real problem, and it's not just here. I mean, this is unfortunately a, a, a worldwide pro problem that we could discuss, um, as, as um, we would say, until the cows come home. Um, I would just add one really yeah. sorry to introduce. I mean, uh, no, I totally agree with you, and I think just, just to add in one last element, just 30 seconds for whoever's listening, like, <laughs> there's, there's the labor laws, which are very rigid, is also the fact that Italy's been stuck, you know, it's a very tight fiscal country. It's, 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 not, it's not like running up a deficit, but it's paying off its old debts. It's been doing that for the last 20, 30 years. Yeah. And that's really draining the economy as, as uh, and also European uh, laws in the Euro European Union and Eurozone about limits to spending that countries should abide by, sort of some this austerity-minded approach. Mm -hmm. So I think... There has to be a broader political and economic shift, and Italy, you know, it can. It's easy to come in here and say, "Oh, look at this place. Everything is rigid and old." I'm not saying again. No, no, no. I'm not suggesting I that's what you. you're saying. But, but there is this tendency. But it does happen. Yes. But you're right. Those are yes. words that and we I hear. I don't think it's like about you know loosening up worker protections is going to jumpstart no, the economy. No, That's the, that's sort of the classic, um, you know, sort of right way. Exactly. I, think, I was, way of saying was about that. to say right. But yeah. So yeah. Go, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, but there needs to be, I mean, this is just, I mean, it's a, it's a conversation that, yeah. that's been going on. Things need to change. Mm -hmm. We need to, you know, we, we need to be thinking about these things. And I'm loving talking to you. And I think, you know, you spoke about way, way at the beginning of this podcast, you said, you know, academia, you know, but I have yeah. other things that I'm interested in. And so as we sort of come to, to an end, I, I want to talk to you more about sort of where you see yourself mm -hmm. right now and what what is appealing to you right now in terms of, you know, projects that you'd like to do or things that you'd like to do. I think you'd be an excellent political commentator. I'm just saying, if you're thinking yeah. about, if you want to come back, we could do a monthly, we could try to, you know, explain Italian politics or, you know, the reality of Italian society. Fun. Today, though, through this really important historical lens, you know, because yeah. you can't ignore those things. And and one of the things that um, that I'm so glad that you spoke about is not only those sort of daily reminders of, of this, you know, this this relationship, but also I think something that we are that we just can't do. Um, and you're an historian, and so it's important that you come and talk about these things. Um, is what what are we doing now? Um, that you know to really change those sort of those mistakes that we've made in the past. But anyway, um, I want to hear more about what what what's in store for you. Um, you know what what would you like to be doing? Um, you know beyond everything you already do yeah. in terms of research and teaching and your writing. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, it's a dynamic point in my life. I have a lot of ideas, but. Um, you know, shifting careers is never easy because I did a PhD in the humanities and the, those train you to be a professor. And I am teaching now, so I feel equipped uh, to do that. But if you want to shift, um, you have to not only, you know, learn new things, but also learn how to sell yourself in a new context. Um, or let's say... Uh, 
show people what you can do. Yeah. Uh, that sounds nicer than selling yourself. <laughs> and uh, so I'd like, you know, I'd like to do sort of writing that is more a uh, political economic commentary with a historical lens. So that could be a, a think tank, an institute, um, for a publication of any sort, you know, I, I like that. And I've done some, you know, I've written a couple of pieces, um, an Italian piece last year with Corriere della Sera about, um, about the, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine f looking from the Turkish perspective. Yeah. So, um, sort of, uh, I, I enjoy... I would enjoy that, and I, I'm continuing to investigate and explore options there. I, am, I have so many projects in mind because I also um, have some historical projects I want to work on. I'd like to finish my, <laughs> I'd like to publish my dissertation as a book, which mm -hmm. was about an epic called Kerolu, so a Turkish uh, epic about um, a bandit, a kind of Robin Hood-like figure who really sort of, his exploits reveal a lot about the about kind of cultural exchanges mm -hmm. but also the just the the social history of ordinary people um in the ottoman empire and in the middle east uh, back in the 17th 18th and 19th centuries um i also would like to um i have a couple other projects i though i won't expound on them now in mind historical and cultural okay and then there's the creative stuff so i i think we've talked about we have this. talked about yes. this yeah you know i love creative writing mm -hmm. i'm not disciplined enough at it because i know that um you need to write every day yeah and someone recently <laughs> told me even if it's just one line just one line you need to write every which day i haven't done since you just have to have. do that yeah but that would uh, but i uh, it's so it's not fun. Easy. Yeah. I know, but I'd it's so, to... it's, but it's, you have to, yeah, you know, and yeah. you have to make the time for it the same way you say, you know, whatever, every day I'm going to get in my however many steps or whatever. You just have to get there and write whatever it is every day. And I yeah. think the creative process is, is, um, is, is just as important as, especially because I love your dissertation topic. We talked about it mm -hmm. a lot and I, I love to see that become perhaps something you know. Oh, even more creative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, it should be. It should be. We I talked mean, about it. It should be a. It's a Hollywood film. Yeah, yeah. If anyone's well, listening, anyone's yeah. interested, you know, yeah. we're always. But but I found it to be such a fascinating story when we spoke about it and could have you know it could see it sort of on yeah. on the silver screen if you oh, will. Definitely, no, I could definitely see that down the line, but. One step at a time. One step at I'll a time. I'll start by getting a book published. Because um, I've written a lot of articles uh, in the last few years, but I, I haven't kind of written a book. So this would be, you know, this is one that has to be written sooner I agree. or later. So I agree. And you'll my, do it. Yeah, that's my, hopefully my plan for this year, together with exploring, you know, continuing to teach, exploring career options, you know, keeping an open mind. Uh, and as I said, I don't know if that will keep me in Italy or take me elsewhere. We'll and that and that was actually going to be my final question for you. So I can't think of a better way for us to end. I hope you'll come back and mm -hmm. hopefully um, presenting your book uh, uh, or really or fun. whatever other wonderful project you have in store. Thank you so much for this incredibly um, informative conversation about something that I don't think a lot of us know too too much about. And I really appreciate um, how you brought together so many aspects of Italy's history and contemporary culture with this really um, just very um, educational and informative approach to, um, to, to what we're experiencing mm -hmm. on, you know, every day as we as sort of move through our lives here in Italy. Well, thank you for this opportunity to share. And I, it's fun to talk about these things outside of the classroom. So if anyone, I'm, I'm always available to talk with anyone. I love making connections, uh, just people who are history nerds or otherwise, uh, uh, because I think for anyone who lives in Italy or is interested in Italy, it's really valuable and interesting to keep those other connections in mind. But I mean, the Mediterranean, it kind of touches us all in some way or yeah. another, I think. So no, it was really fun. So I really appreciate it. Thank the you. Thanks. Thank you so much. E grazie a tutti. Arrivederci. Thank you once again for tuning in to this week's episode of 15 with Fosca and for continuing to do so. Grazie mille e alla prossima volta.